This is Naked Mormonism. I pledge my life, all that I may have. I will strive to the utmost of my ability to be what you would want me to be. It's time to find the truth. And having set our hand to the plow, we will never look back until this work is finished. Where is the church heading? I have faith that the Constitution will be saved as prophesied by Joseph Smith. But it will not be saved in Washington. It will be saved by enlightened members of this church. The explicit tag is there for a reason. So if you get offended at what's said, it's not for you. But most importantly... When you ponder the truths you've heard, may they help you become even better than you were. Skepticize everything. Oh. Welcome to special edition episode 35 of the Naked Mormonism podcast, the Serial Mormon History podcast. Today is Thursday, December 22nd. My name is Bryce Blanken Eagle, and thank you for joining me. Today's interview is a very straightforward and uh, fascinating discussion. So without further ado, we're just going to jump right into my interview with Cody. I'm joined here today by a gentleman named Cody Nakoni. And I will allow him to essentially introduce himself a little bit because he's brought a fair amount of research to my attention lately. And um, needless to say, it's very fascinating and, in my opinion, compelling. And um, I've invited him in to discuss this and really kind of give this a proper platform to be discussed. So, Cody, welcome to the show. Thank you, Bryce. Um, You'll have to excuse me. My voice is still a little scratchy from... My kid's being sick. Um, <laughs> no problem. I uh, am a mycologist, or like an am- amateur mycologist. I uh, study comparative religions and theology. That's been my passion since I left the church when I was 18. Okay. Um, the history has been fascinating. I've enjoyed uh, your podcast. And I think I have some interesting insights on uh, the possible entheogen use uh of Joseph Smith and his, um, that's actually, that gives us a pretty good segue into talking about it. Um, because we're going to do this discussion in a two episode piece, uh, two separate pieces. Episode one, we're the first part of the discussion. We're going to establish the historical record for entheogen use and um, essentially what mycology has brought us in the past few decades of its study. And then part two, we're going to talk about its possible influence on Joseph Smith and um, in, in early church revelations and whatnot. And um, this needs to be said before we engage in the discussion. What we're talking about here are fringe theories. Uh, there is... Uh, the vast majority of scholars would call this nothing but speculation, and I think that that probably speaks more to the taboos of the the perspective as opposed to the actual explanatory power of the theory. And um, that being said, I hope everybody will approach these next episodes with an open mind and consider the information on the merit of the information alone. Not who's giving it, not um, how it's presented, but the information itself, this uh, this research. And maybe even take this as a jumping off point to engage into deeper studies in these fields, because quite frankly, this is something that has not really been proposed as a very solid theory by many people, and it seems to be gaining a little bit more traction with the restoration of the sacred mushroom that was presented at Sunstone mm-hmm. in 07. And... Um, if there's any explanatory power to this theory, then it needs to be in the open public sphere, and we need to talk about it. And that's why I'm bringing yourself on, because, you know, Cody, you're much more knowledgeable about this stuff. Um, but before we get into that discussion, 
I got to take at least a couple of minutes and ask you a little bit about your history in the church personally. <laughs> okay. Well, let's hear a little bit about your story here, Cody. Um, my, it's not a positive one, uh, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, Many of them aren't. <laughs> <laughs> I was uh, a queer kid growing up in the church. I was very um, uncomfortable, let's say. Uh, I had a very confusing teenage uh, upbringing. I... The church uh, instilled in me a lot of negative behaviors that I had to uh, spend about a decade uh, deprogramming and um, getting them out of my my life. Uh, mm-hmm. So it's been a long process that uh, I went into this, like most kids, uh, going into seminary with a genuine desire to uh, learn the material that they were presenting me. Um, and I was either fortunate or unlucky enough to start my seminary career with doctrine and covenants. So I started by learning all the history and was so shocked by like, Oh my God, you guys believe this, (laughs) that it, uh, it instilled a, uh, just a passion for this material that, uh, threw me down the rabbit hole and I haven't really stopped since then. Um, unfortunately, none of my family wants to hear any of this. <laughs> right. Um, Weird how that works. It's funny how that works. But um, that's where I'm at now. I've, uh, I've been studying mycology and magic and a number of other things that are related to this topic, uh, which give me, I think, a, a nuanced perspective and an ability to see it from a, a, new, a new position. Um, and like you said, I understand how this can sound. This is very... Uh, um, <laughs> it sounds like crazy hippie talk. Right. Um, well, and let's just say, like, um, the magic you're talking about, you yourself are not studying the spells. You are studying the history of it and its influence no, on cultures. I'm not a practicing magician, I, no. <laughs> uh, but I do find the the subject immensely fascinating, and it's it's a whole other rabbit hole you can go down. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, Joseph's... Real, uh, relationship with magic is is immensely uh, fascinating as well and well substantiated well documented have to say yes. that. it's really really well substantiated by i mean most mormon scholars even i mean richard bushman and uh, mm-hmm. bh roberts even i mean the connections that joseph has had to occult practices and magic with a k are you know simply not irrefutable. I mean, you, you can't say that he didn't have those connections simple as that. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the people he was learning from a lot of his mentors, uh, Lumen Walters, of course, was one and many others engaged Samuel Lawrence engaged in a lot of this, this magic, uh, magical and, you know, spiritual type of idea. Hiram Smith as well, who, who owned the magical, uh, tools that, that we have from the Smith family. Um, and actually the Mormon, the fair Mormon apologist, uh, argument is that, well, it was Hiram's stuff. It doesn't matter, <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, but then Joe dies with a talisman in his pocket and he was clearly yeah. using the same materials. Right. Uh, they were, I mean, they were, I assume they were both learning from the same people. Well, and what, buds. if your brother has uh, several parchments full of Anakian magic and you're known for running around using Anakian ceremonial magic. And you're using seer stones in order to find buried treasure. And, exactly. You know, these various spells. It's not a great leap to, at the very least, maybe your brother shared. <laughs> right. So. It's not really hard to, yeah, make that leap. Um, but of course, we want to talk about Joseph and the church in the second part of this discussion, Mm -hmm. the first part is going to be establishing the history, establishing the record. So we can kind of come out the 1830s with the perspective of everything leading up to it, as opposed to um, looking at it with hindsight, with our own prejudices that we have concerning magic or concerning um, ethnogen use or whatever the case may be. So let's, I guess, let's just dive right into this. Okay. Could take us back to the beginning, man. Okay, God created the earth, <laughs> then he created mushrooms, and then people started evolving. <laughs> well, that's a way to put it. Um, entheogens have been with us from the beginning. Um, I'm, I focus mainly on uh, mushrooms and fungi, uh, but essentially there's 
there are so many plants that can elicit this, this, uh, um, mindset that it's almost too much to go into. Um, when you get back to, uh, prehistory, one of the first things we see is, uh, the cultivation of entheogens. Some have argued that even the, uh, adoption of agriculture was birthed from our, uh, desire to have regular entheogens, not just seasonally. That seems spurious as yeah, if that, uh, maybe that, it was more for food first and then let's start tripping after we know mm-hmm. where we can get our food from. And some of these are hard to get at because like the further, for the further you go back, the less and less uh, verifiable any of this information is, right. and the more speculative it gets. Um, the, it is interesting to note that like the Mesopotamians and the Egyptians, one of the first things they start doing is brewing beer, arguably before they do anything else. Um, okay. uh, there's a, a famous quote that says something to the effect of men were uh, brewers before they were bakers. Um, <laughs> we, we may have discovered baking bread through brewing beer, but by making yeast cakes, for example. Interesting. Um, and mushroom use is another uh, prime example. You have to create a, a completely separate environment for mushrooms to grow in. Uh, so you basically trick them into thinking they're in the right season. Um, and if you have a, a pretty cursory understanding of mycology, you can achieve that. And you- or just really any um, agricultural anything. I mean, yeah. it, it's just... I mean, I, I guess it's not just like every other plant because fungi are in a, a whole subsect of flora in and of himself, but I know they're separate from what we consider you know, vegetables and whatnot. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you're growing crops for food, you have a cursory understanding that these certain plants need these things, these conditions in order to live. So why wouldn't that apply for, for fungi or for anything else? Mm-hmm. Right? Or for humans, for that matter. And you you eventually learn to pre- preserve these things, too. Like uh, Datura, which we'll talk about later, grows in most gardens. So if you were growing food, it would be no great leap to see this giant plant that smells funky. Like it's, Datura smells like medicine. Um, mm. And it's no great leap to assume that there's some medicinal quality in that and uh, well, start experimenting with it. And even, I mean, most people have morning glory in their garden. Mm-hmm. That's just, you know, strangling their plants. But mm-hmm. you know, most people don't realize it's a nightshade and it's it'll send you on a really hard trip if you eat some of the seeds. A lot of the entheogens we'll talk about are considered weeds. Yeah. They're, they're things most people wouldn't recognize as being uh, vehicles to the divine. <laughs> but they, they do contain uh, a lot of power within them. Um, and we've discovered that almost since the beginning, uh, for example, that, uh, I'll give you a picture of this. There's the Talisi cave drawings of the mushroom shaman. I, I showed you. He, uh, that dates from anywhere from five to 7,000 BC. So uh, let's give the listeners a little bit of a description here. Um, it's a black and white photo and this was, was it a cave drawing or was it on papyri or what? this was, uh, from the Talisi caves in Northern Algeria. Okay. And essentially, it looks like a, a human form with a bee head and maybe some antlers and a hand on the side. But the, the human form of it is essentially just covered in every square inch with mushrooms. Every, they, I mean, they could be anything, but they just just look like mushrooms are growing from every part of this, this humanoid bee-looking type of creature. Um, and of course, everything that we talk about, there's going to be heavy links and sources for and of course there will be a picture of this in the show notes um so that's a, a, a brief description of this cave drawing he said this is from like seven thousand years ago it's dated somewhere between five and th- five and seven thousand bc oh so yeah nine thousand you know mm-hmm. seven to nine thousand years ago wow and these the people who are uh, presenting these interpretations of this drawing are no slouches themselves these are people that are well respected in their field um Albert Hoffman, who first synthesized psilocybin and LSD, he mm-hmm. was he knew about this painting. Paul Stamets, who lives pretty close uh, in this area, he's a renowned mycologist, and this is oh, this is almost always in one of the first pages of every one of his books. No kidding. He loves to to push this picture because it's the symbolism is stark. You cannot uh, deny that it looks very clearly like a mushroom. Yeah, it's mushrooms all over this this mm-hmm. humanoid figure. Absolutely. And if there's any one picture that the listener should look at in the show notes, I, I would say this is probably one of the most profound because this was a cave drawing. This is, I mean, this is, this didn't come down through, um, 
you know, through religious texts or, you know, given through oral tradition that was eventually transcribed. Uh, this is somebody scratched this onto the wall of a cave. Mm -hmm. It's hard to argue that this, you know, that, that, that this is anachronistic or something to that effect, or this is somebody is just taking this and they are applying their own theory or own rationalizations to it. You look at the picture of this thing, it's a human figure covered in mushrooms. Mm -hmm. It's really, really simple. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to deny. Um, the, this isn't an, an isolated incident either. This is, we have the, the stone mushroom carvings from South America that date back to about one to 3000 BC. Um, and the, this is all over the globe. <laughs> this is almost culturally universal. And while it did die out in some areas for long periods of time, in some instances, this has been on the periphery of society almost since the beginning when we were in caves. Hmm. Um, and in many societies who have never had writing. I mean, uh, one of the pictures you showed me, you might have it here on your paper, uh, is of these small stone figures that have mushrooms on their heads, above their heads. Mm -hmm. And there's like hundreds of them. And this is from the, the Aztec Empire, mm -hmm. or Mayan Empire. I, I can't remember the, the, the application of it. But this is, I mean, this is an American, uh, these are American statues long before colonialization ever happened. Mm -hmm. You know, they didn't have any writing at the time in the empire to tell what it was. It's just stone statues with mushrooms on their heads. Mm -hmm. uh, very powerful symbolism there. Yep. And you, you find this again, all over the globe. You can find this in, uh, in Australia. You find this in Iceland. You find this in a lot of the Scandinavian cultures. You find it in Canada. You find it in America. The Algonquin tribes were reported to have been using Amanitas as late as the 19th century. Oh, no um, so it, it survived. It was, it was on the periphery, if not on, on the center stage at times. Right. Um, and there were certainly times where it was on the center stage, like at Eleusis in, uh, it was a famous Grecian ceremony that, uh, venerated Dionysus and Persephone. That ceremony lasted over almost 2000 years uninterrupted. Can you tell us a little bit about that ceremony and the, uh, I mean, I guess, what do we point to specifically in that ceremony that we can say, they were definitely using ethiogens. Uh, well, Eleusis was a very famous ceremony. It, uh, basically, anyone and everyone you've ever heard of from the Greek world took part in this ceremony. Uh, it was offered to everybody of any class, uh, free man, scholar, slave, like anybody could do this. Uh, and there's uh, an, actually a really interesting uh, story where a uh, prostitute uh, gets one of her lovers to uh, donate a substantial amount of money to allow her to go to this rite. Wow. And uh, there's <laughs> there's a whole side story involving the fiasco that ensues. Um, <laughs> anyway, I digress. There's <laughs> The ceremony at Eleusis was uh, apparently a a moment of gnosis for the ancient Greeks. They, they had a, a moment where they visually and viscerally got to understand the Greek pantheon, or at least uh, be a part of it for just a moment. Hmm. Um, okay. We do know that it took place twice in the year. There was the lesser mysteries and the greater mysteries. The greater mysteries is what we'll focus on um, because that was the culmin the culmination of the the yearly event. Okay. And it was one night where uh, participants were taken underground or into this cave-like structure. They were uh, given a drink, which is very likely hallucinogenic, uh, from a cup called the kaikion. And we have a, a sort of recipe for what was in the kaikion, so we can speculate what was it what it did. Okay. Um, let's, let's talk about that because that's relevant to the discussion. Mm -hmm. Do you have in your notes what, you know, what we can speculate that the, the recipe was, mm -hmm. uh, or, you know, specifically what entheogen might've been involved? Uh, the ergot is in my opinion, the most likely candidate. Uh, there's yeah. been a, there's been several scholars who put forth that there was some type of mushroom brew that was happening, but based on, the recipe we're given of water, barley, uh, pennyroyal, and one other herb. I can't remember off the top of my head. Okay. Um, basically, the, the easiest hallucinogenic brew that you could make from those ingredients is an ergotized beer uh, mm -hmm. by yeah. taking uh, contaminated grain heads found, and threshing them out and then making a beer from the contaminated grains. And um, 
let's just uh, say, so ergot is in and of itself a, uh, is it a fungus that grows on, uh, it, it leaches off of uh, wheat or off of mm-hmm. um, other crops that way. And you can tell very clearly uh, a crop that's infected with ergot because it just has these weird, nasty, greenish kind of mm-hmm. beige growths on it. So if you have a, a bundle of wheat in your hand, you can very clearly see the ones that are infected with ergot. It so was a very like, common practice to as you were th- as you were going through cutting down the wheat to separate the grains. They talk about this in the Bible a lot, separating your grains and the wheat from the shaft, the bad grains from the good grains. Mm-hmm. This was a common part of harvesting your grains. You had to look for this. And I figure I I always heard that like separating the wheat from the chaff. That's like when you're uh, when you have a sifter, just so you're pulling out all the the wheat. Uh, grains themselves Mm -hmm. and getting rid of all of the the shells and the husks and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. That's what I've always heard, but I guess it could be interpreted both ways. You're you're correct. There's, there's another, um, scripture I don't have on, I I have a million notes, so you have to, (laughs) not a problem. Um, it's a huge topic. There's another, uh, scripture that references the, the separating of the, um, not just the wheat from the shaft, the, but the, uh, the good grains from the bad grains. Okay. Uh, it has to do with the field is white and ready to harvest. Oh, um, the, the field turns white when you, when it's ready to harvest and it's easier to see the, the, uh, contaminated spots. Uh, so as you're going through cutting down the wheat, you can uh, kind of isolate the areas that are contaminated. Interesting. Okay. And yeah, I mean, it's very clear to see that ergot is, and when you are, uh, when you're threshing the wheat, uh, and essentially refining it so you can actually turn it into bread or anything like that, you do uh, you leave ergot on the floor, mm-hmm. essentially. I, I mean, all of the the growths of it get, get left on the floor, or I, I guess they're bound to you know some of the the chemicals bound to the the wheat in and of itself. Mm-hmm. And like you said, you can make ergot beer. And there is some contention with this theory because ergot is uh, does have a reputation for being uh, convulsive or for having. Uh, uh, negative physical side effects. Uh, okay. There's some evidence of gangrenous uh, limb loss, uh, swelling of the belly, uh, convulsion, seizures. Wow. Uh, That's nasty. It's pretty That's nasty. Um, it was Albert Hoffman who first synthesized psilocybin and LSD. His contention was that uh, the uh, priest said Eleusis could have uh, floated a hot boiling oil on the ergotized beer, thus drawing off the convulsive alkaloids and leaving just a hallucinogenic brew, okay. which would explain how thousands of people every year got hallucinogenically stoned in a relatively safe place. Cause we without, would, you know, half of them dying, which, half which of them would losing su- a limb. That's scary stuff. And would survive through the historical record. Like the, right. the plains of Eleusis and the, and the mystery schools would have had a reputation for danger. Right if that type of thing was taking place. But as far as we can tell, it was a pretty safe ceremony. Interesting. Um, and I know that a uh, possible uh, an ergot brew makes its way into the Bible in Numbers 5 mm-hmm. that I remember reading it myself and saying, so there is abortion in the Bible. <laughs> okay, well, that's really simple, but I didn't make anything else of it. But this, um, this brew, essentially, this is Numbers 5 from the, the beginning of the chapter, it talks about uh, if you feel like your wife has been unfaithful um, and she's pregnant with another man's child, then you take her to the temple and they mix up a drink from the, the dirt of the floor of Solomon's temple mm-hmm. and make her drink it. And if she is okay, if she survives, then it's okay. Uh, she's she's truthful, but if she loses the, the child and her thigh is caused to rot or whatever the case is, then she's uh, she's not faithful, mm-hmm. and I know you personally. You point to that being ergot, ergot, because it was a threshing floor where they took the the brew from. Well, not only not only the threshing floor, but the temple of Solomon had a threshing floor in it. So uh, it it's hard for me to believe that a temple would need a threshing floor unless it was being used for some type of divine rite. Or some mm-hmm. type of mystery school, or some type of uh, trial by fire, if you will, because that's essentially what they're doing with these women uh, in this scene in Numbers is they're giving two women an ergotized uh, water extraction, but they're leaving 
not only the convulsive alkaloids, but they're actually leaving the dust from the floor. So the likelihood that one of them is going to experience a, a negative trip is really high. Right, right. And then you're kind of leaving it up to the gods, quote unquote. Right. I mean, Game of Thrones trial by combat. Or exactly. Whatever, same type of thing. I mean, that was just a mindset that these people had at the mm-hmm. time. It, 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 they didn't understand the chemistry of what Urgot is doing to an infant child or... Um, you know, why things were happening the way they were. It was just the will of God. And the the threshing floor from Solomon's temple survives today with Freemasonry. The, the, there's a lot of heavy symbolism with the threshing floor from Solomon's temple in the Masonic rites, as well as a lot of symbolism involving waterfalls and corn or wheat grains, uh, which some have interpreted to be a, a water extraction, much like you would do a fresh pr- a French press with coffee. Oh, okay. That's uh, that symbolism is supposed to represent some type of uh, yeah, ergot drink sure. that you you separate out all the all the debris, and you're just left with basically hallucinogenic tea of sorts. Interesting. Um, and so this this wasn't just at Solomon's Temple. This is uh, been this has survived through several mystery schools up till today, and I know like uh, Robert Price, who's a famous minimalist. Um, I've heard him mention a couple of times in the Bible Geek podcast that certain scholars do think that uh, Christianity evolved out, or not just Christianity, but the the Hebrew religion um, evolved out of essentially some of these mushroom cults. Mm-hmm. And these, these hallucinogen cults where they had one elder that knew how to make a hallucinogenic brew and they would have their their uh, ritualistic ceremonies. One of these people may very well be Moses, if he was a real person. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know a fair amount of the, the various Gnostic sects that were um, existing at the time that Jesus supposedly existed. Um, and there's a fair amount of speculation, uh, or I guess it's not speculation, but a fair amount of scholars that would claim that those were indeed mushroom cults or mm-hmm. hallucinogen cults as well. We know they were already working on the fringes, uh, like uh, Carpocrates, for example, was, a, a, I believe, a third century um, Christian cult leader who was kind of uh, <laughs> disliked by his contemporaries, okay. to say the least. And that's a prime example of somebody who was already uh, inducting orgiastic ceremonies and just going <laughs> crazy on his own to add mushrooms to the mix is not a great leap. Right. Um, especially since we know the, this information was circulating at the time. Right. Well, and let's also take this opportunity to say the way that we look at hallucinogens, whether they're mushrooms or they are, you know, chemically uh, distilled into LSD or whatever the case may be, or MDMA, uh, I guess that's not typ- uh, typically called a hallucinogen, is MDMA? Hmm. Okay. Yes. Uh, but regardless, we're looking at this from our own 21st century post-war on drugs perspective. Mm-hmm. A lot of what we're talking about may be taboo for somebody that's been living in America or anywhere that's suffered from the war on drugs for the past 50 years. But any time before that... It wasn't taboo. It wasn't something that was banned. You weren't going to go to jail for her eating mushrooms in the 1870s. No, the problem. Or, I mean, the, going way further back. It's like we're looking at a very postmodern perspective of what we're discussing right now. But we have to strip that away. We have to understand. Instead of looking back, we need to understand from way early on, looking forward. Right. And also understand that when you read accounts of people being drunk. Uh, pre-prohibition, they may not necessarily be referring to alcohol. Uh, hmm. It was pretty well uh, known that plant medicines could get you stoned or drunk, and using them was not necessarily the problem because alcohol was used medicinally. Oh, yeah. um, and there were plenty of examples of plant medicines being uh, incorporated into alcohols. Well, because it's a powerful solvent. And the, yeah, and the Book of Mormon even talks about medicated alcohols. Uh, yeah, tra- or yeah, poisoning people with mm-hmm. alcohol. And, yeah, with wine, poisoning the the, ne- the Lamanites. And, mm-hmm. Yeah, well, that's true. So the, it wasn't necessarily what you were getting high or drunk on. The problem was excess. The problem was getting to that point where you're drunk and now you're a problem for the community. Um, <laughs> Especially if that that wine is infused with some really crazy shit, like exactly. or something, right? <laughs> 
Um, it's often uh, said that it's not LSD that kills you; it's the things you do on LSD. So, you, <laughs> if enough. you if you're going buck wild and the and the community has to rein you in constantly, then you pretty quickly gain a reputation for being the town drunk, right? Or but if you're brawling with people and whatnot. Mm-hmm. And alcohol is not always available, especially at the time. So. People would have been experimenting and seeking out new forms of intoxication. Yeah, because alcohol can sometimes get expensive, but when you go pick up shit off of the forest floor, that's free. At the time that's of Joseph, really easy. at the time of Joseph Smith, I believe a, a room for the night cost something like six cents, but a bottle of whiskey cost like a dollar twenty-five. Oh well, yes, yeah, so, so yeah, it I was mean, it, it was a very expensive habit. And uh, <laughs> that's probably why these men experimented. We have a lot of cases and instances where the early Mormons were clearly experimenting with, with substances they didn't know whether or not they'd get high off of. We'll have to talk more about that. <laughs> that'll be, again, that'll be, you're, you're yeah. piquing my curiosity <laughs> as well as my skepticism, I must say. Um, and we'll have to talk into that on part two. But let's continue in part one. So we're, we're kind of in... Um, essentially early Bible times, these uh, these hallucinogens possibly being incorporated into their rituals 2,000 years ago, 3,000 years mm-hmm. ago and stuff. I mean, this, is, it, this isn't necessarily fringe theory. This is, I mean, a number of scholars would agree, a number of historians would agree with this. Right? Exactly. Um, and it goes even back farther than that. The Egyptians had a pretty well-established pharmacopoeia. The Mesopotamians knew about mushrooms and ergot and... Really? All of that. They they called uh, hallucinogenic mushrooms were referred to as demon penises, <laughs> because they were. Well, uh, fuck you up. <laughs> they will, and they're uh, they're the original immaculate conception. You have a sky god that is raining down his is, and inseminating the virgin mother earth, and these little demon penises are the immaculately conceived children of the t- of the union. Interesting perspective, I must say. Um, of course, <laughs> like a lot of what you're saying, you're you just saying it out there and i personally don't have the sources in front of me i can't verify a lot of what you're saying so um hopefully the show notes of this episode as well as the next episode will be one paragraph describing it and then nine paragraphs of just um sources because Mm -hmm. i want people to engage further into studying this and the, the people who are studying this that are legitimate scientists and scholars aren't necessarily uh, deadheads, if you like, some of these people, like Richard Evan Schultz, for example, has established his entire career off of being a neutral perspective. He does not use these materials. He mm. studies them so that he we can have a neutral voice. Interesting. And his entire career has been built on that. And he is a very well respected ethnobotanist. Mm. So this is not just a fringe theory. This is a pretty well established. Uh, theory that's gaining more and more uh, followers behind it. And it's um, unfortunately fairly new. I mean, only in the last century have we really been applying the scientific method to a lot of these things. And halfway through the last century, they were banned. And every scholar was forced to distance themselves from anything that was hallucinogenic because... Suddenly there's a war on drugs. You lose your license. You go to jail if you're studying mushrooms. Exactly. You can be uh, labeled a communist. And, and <laughs> oh, <even worse>. God, <laughs> no. Yeah, I mean, that, that, so the, the study, essentially the field of mycology is a very young field when it comes to scientific studies. Mm-hmm. I mean, a very hard scientific study on the, the chemicals themselves have only been going on really for... I mean, the past maybe decade or so. Is that correct? Uh, serious scientific work that's been picked up again, yes, in like the last 10 years or so. Uh, the people over at MAPS, uh, the Multidisciplinary Association of Psychedelic Studies, uh, anyone that's listening to this should look them up immediately. Okay, MAPS. Uh, there will be a link for that in the show notes. Rick Doblin. Uh, has probably done more, aside from Rick Straussman, to single-handedly legitimize this field. Wow. He... Okay. By uh, he recognized that we needed to have a subject group that we could test that no one could argue with. So his way of doing this was taking soldiers, firefighters, policemen, all good, moral, upstanding people who we know have PTSD, who have problems from doing the job that we ask them to do, and then putting them in uh, laboratory settings 
and giving them double performing double double blind studies, giving each uh, participant a uh, certified psychoanalyst, a therapist. These people are babysat while they're tripping. This isn't just right. locking them in a room and giving them drugs. Um, <laughs> that's more like uh, that's the underground shit of the 1920s that I picture, right? <laughs> and this is being done by uh, John Hopkins. This is being backed up by Harvard. This is right. this is legitimate science that's starting to come out. Mm-hmm. And uh, what Rick Doblin and the people at MAPS particularly have found is that these substances are miraculous in their ability to uh, flip people uh, psychologically. It's been called 30 years of psychotherapy in a night. <laughs> the ability- I mean, for, as a skeptic, that just sounds so spurious. It, and, I mean, it's like there's no such thing as a wonder drug. I mean, okay, Viagra is an exception. But it gives you headaches. Like, I mean, I, that uh, that sounds so spurious. I have to look into it. Myself. There are drawbacks to this. It's not all love, light, and healing. Uh, right. and, the and Mesoamericans what? were uh, killing people by the tens of thousands uh, using these substances in their religious rites. So well, there is a dark right. side to this too. <laughs> okay. Well, and yeah, I mean, even we were talking a little bit about ergot poisoning. That fucks you up, like, you know, limbs falling off and seizures and like, I I mean, when they're studied at, you know, uh, with a scientific method and people are in a controlled setting with professionals that are babysitting them and they're given, you know, just enough to be a threshold dosage and then studied beyond that and not just given, you know, two handfuls of mushrooms and they're, they're just good luck. Like this, we're applying the scientific method to this. It's very important to understand that our prejudices against many of these chemicals only spawn from the fear of drugs you know the 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 dare type of idea of anything that's a drug is bad but it's like everybody takes drugs every day but they've just gone through the fda approval process Mm -hmm. whereas mycology is still so early on in this field isn't it (laughs) what's so taboo that it's hard to get it to that level exactly Mormons today use it aren't isn't Utah supposed to be the number one user of antidepressants uh, yeah i I haven't been able to verify that number very well, but it's definitely way up yeah yeah and and, I, and it also plays into the fact that so many Mormons don't self medicate with alcohol whereas most people do self medicate with alcohols um if they're if they are experiencing depression or whatever the case may be, so Mormons don't have that fallback they don't have the the alcohol that they can go to. So, but they do have the pharmaceuticals. In my experience, yeah. I've 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 experienced that myself. Um, yeah. The as long as it comes from a doctor, it's okay. Yeah, if you go to the prescri- you go to the pharmacy and fill it up, you know, you get a little bottle with a special label on it. It's okay. But if you go walking through the the forest and pick up a couple of mushrooms, it's not. Well, it just seems like a wildly ignorant perspective, right? It is, and it's not one that the early Mormons would have shared, honestly, or right. even the early Christians. There's pre-prohibition, the maybe we should talk about the idea of sacrament, um, because a lot of people who are looking at this also see the correlations uh, between the experiences you have in the psychedelic state and the religious rites like sacrament that are supposed to mimic what you experience in a psychedelic state. When you, when you take the sacrament and you're supposed to give yourself a life review over the last week and look at all the things that you've done that maybe have pissed off God and meditating, you're meditating on your life and how you can improve yourself and be a better person. And that's the, that's the repentance process. And the sacrament you're taking is, it's a magical ceremony, but it's supposed to be a physical representation of that repentance process. Right. And, and it's very ritualistic that you speak a spell over it every time. And mm-hmm. I mean, you said sacrament blessings. Right? <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> you're, a, you're a deacon. I did that quite a few priest, times. I mean, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, the perspective we have of it now is, um, yeah, it's all postmodern. It's all post well, well, imagine drugs, imagine so taking a substance prejudice. that forced that experience on you. How right, many times right. were you in sacrament where you saw somebody just take the sacrament and then fuck off and th- play on their cell phone or something? I was one of them. <laughs> I was one of them too. It's fine. Yeah, we all do it. But imagine taking a, a substance that it doesn't matter how you feel about the situation. You are going to have a life review and you're going to come out of the other on the other end 
at least with the desire to be a better person. It's an interesting thought. And that, uh, and if if these these repentance and meditative processes are elicited by whatever sacrament you're imbibing in, then yeah, you don't have a choice. If you're going to trip, you're going to trip, whether you want to or not. Mm-hmm. If somebody hands you a you know anointing oil or a wine that's that's infused with a hallucinogenic chemical, you don't have much of a choice. It's it's re- it's repeatable over and over. Mm-hmm. You're going to have the trip every time. And it allows you to look at situations that perhaps you need a fresh perspective on. Um, and that's why it's such a useful tool in psychoanalyst, um, for psychoanalysts, the analysis, excuse me. <laughs> um, it's, we get into these repetitive, uh, funks where we just do the same thing over and over and we cope with the same things. Uh, these chemicals have a, a way of facilitating a, response where you get to look at the same situation like you are someone else. And a lot of the times that's, that's shattering to somebody's perspective of reality. Um, especially when you're doing shitty things and you get to realize and understand and actually feel empathy for the first time. (laughs) Oh, I am being an asshole. Yeah. Damn it. (laughs) Why didn't anybody tell me? Exactly. All right. And, um, yeah. Um, I know some, People have claimed, and I'm, I'm taking this based off of our previous discussions, um, just a little behind-the-scenes type of stuff. This is our third conversation that we've had on this topic. Um, I wanted to kind of screen you before bringing you on. I wanted to make sure that you had your ducks in a row and you actually have enough sources to provide a, you know, a legitimate body of knowledge. And you've definitely passed the threshold in my previous conversations. So that being said, taking this from previous conversations... Um, I know you said that uh, some people have claimed that the the ability for humans to uh, reason and to think of something uh, as an abstract principle, think about their own existence, essentially came from entheogen use. And as people uh, searched for new entheogens, that's where our brains began developing the outer lobes that are not as uh, they're, they're not the reptilian brain mm-hmm. and we're able to conceptualize things in the abstract and discuss our own existence to a certain extent which is something that uh, as far as we're aware no other animals really do and i know that you and uh, another person that i've been speaking with about this topic have claimed that that's like, that that was kind of a driver of human evolution essentially right well it's a theory um it's kind of a loose theory, but it's a, it's interesting and it's worth discussion. Okay. Uh, it's, I don't know who met, who came up with it first. I'm familiar with it through Terrence McKenna. Okay. Um, he wrote a book called food of the gods, uh, and he calls it his stoned ape theory where, uh, <laughs> <laughs> where uh. apes in the arboreal rainforests were, began experimenting, uh, with foods. And one of the first things that they would have found are mushrooms and you see an unprecedented uh, doubling of our ancestors' brain capacity over the space of some two million years, which is, Crazy. from an evolutionary perspective, like, unfucking real Right, right. And... Yeah, and it's measured by the fossils we've dug up and calculating the, the cubic centimeter mm-hmm. capacity of their brains, yeah. simple as that, of their skulls. And then... He, it's from then on you start to see this this explosion of of art and uh, sophistication of language. You start to see music, burial rites. You you start to see the humanity that we see we recognize emerge from the apes. Right. Um, and again, well, like I said it's so far back. It's you can't really substantiate anything like that. But it is worth noting, and it is something that bears discussion. Right. And this is a long, long before. We've had any sort of writing. Uh, this is before cave drawings really made an appearance. I mean, what we're speculating or what what these theories are essentially based off of is loose archaeological evidence mm-hmm. because there's nothing more, there's nothing and, else to base it off. And of. there's some solid archaeo- archaeological evidence. We have evidence of uh, fly agaric uh, or Amanita muscario being used by the Siberian shamans uh, since the last ice age. So. Uh, for to let listeners know, Amanita muscaria—that is the 
uh, the picturesque toadstool mushroom, the the red with the white spots on it. That's um, you yeah. know the the Mario mushroom. That's the mushroom that people picture when you think of a, a hallucinogenic mushroom. That's the Amanita, or even a non hallucinogenic hallucinogenic mushroom. Most people think of that just because that's probably the most iconic mushroom in the world, um, mm-hmm. and it's been used in art especially in uh, Western culture for the last 200 years, just all over the place, especially right. during this time of year. Uh, Christmas is a great time to see all, all of that. Um, <laughs> uh, we well, won't go into Santa, but... <laughs> uh, oh, dear. All right. So there's uh, some theories there. Well, well, there's some serious connections with uh, our conception of what Santa is and the evolution of uh, Christianity picking up that that archetype and running with it. Fun fact, uh, the Santa in Holland uh, is known as Sinterklaas mm-hmm. instead of Santa Claus. He has an assistant known as Sweat Pete. Black Pete. Sometimes. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and the, Hol- the people in Holland oh. to celebrate it will just literally put on blackface. And then for some oh reason they God. get defensive when you accuse them of racism. We'll have to talk more about Black <laughs> but, Pete. Yeah, later. Black Pete. That was Sinterklaas' uh, assistant. Oh my god, I didn't know. I wonder if he's associated with Krampus. I'll have to look this up. I know, I think Krampus is a different theology. I okay. think that was Germanic or something. Okay. Yeah, but I, I only know that because I briefly studied it right before I uh, did a Krampus costume for this huge ball that my girlfriend took me to. Okay. And it's, I got my, my face painted to look like Krampus and I had the fangs, but the lighting was so low in the room, it just looked like I had blackface the whole thing. <laughs> and I got the weirdest looks and I didn't realize it until I got home and looked in the mirror again and I was like, oh, fuck. Oh, I was why. that guy at the party. Damn it. Uh, anyway, sorry, sorry. Huge digression. And you're a ginger, so I'm sure that didn't help. <laughs> Essentially. Uh, um, okay, so uh, back on the timeline, let's... Uh, yeah, um, so using these these mushrooms and stuff as an evolution, essentially, uh, or helped humans evolve, and then oh yes, that. okay. Um, you sent over a lot of really interesting pictures in you know before our second discussion, and many of them were of Adam and Eve, or of Jesus, or other Christian figures mm-hmm. with mushroom symbolism rife throughout the pictures. Can we discuss some of those and describe them to the listeners? Yeah. We start to see mushroom symbolism uh, creep its way into Christian art about the same time we see hermeticism and alchemy infuse itself into Western Europe. Interesting. Uh, Which is why this theory is so interesting to me, is because we see a clear um, path of hermeticism and alchemy mushroom and entheogen use following uh, this timeline into Christendom and Western Europe and following over into America. And you, you see a lot of early contemporaries of Joseph Smith using mushrooms and entheogens. Um, we can go into that later, but yeah, it's, we'll, we'll, we'll I'm get sorry. I keep yeah, bouncing exactly. back and forth. The timeline is so messed up and it all, it's all, it all helps each other that it's it's hard not to focus on. Um, I created a podcast to describe... I, I mean, it's taken me two years to get, you know, 30 years into Joseph's life. What we're talking about spans millennia. So it's kind of hard to, to follow a strict timeline when so much of it is, you know, a massive theory that requires a lot of pre-knowledge to, mm-hmm. <laughs> to embark upon. Um but yeah, let's let's talk about some of the, the symbolism and hermeticism. Describe to us a little bit what about you know I'm asking for a friend. What exactly is hermeticism? <laughs> <laughs> um, hermeticism is birthed about the same time. It's a Hellenistic tradition from that was taken from Egypt, and the Greeks ran with it in the early second and third century. Uh, okay. about the same time that we see the Jewish Gnostic sects starting to become Christians as we know them. Okay. Um, the, it had, it had been, it's hard to date because it's supposed to have been much older than that, but we really only have, uh, their hermetic corpus to go off of. And originally it was believed that the writer of the hermetic corpus, Hermes Trismegistus, which is where we get her- hermeticism, mm-hmm. uh, Hermes Trismegistus was supposed to have been a contemporary of Abraham, 
and a grandson of Adam. He was uh, one of the oldest theologians and philosophers that they knew of at the time. And so the Hermetic Corpus was considered to be one of the oldest works of philosophy. Um, It wasn't until the 16th century that it was properly dated. Uh, Actually, it was the early 17th century. I think it was 1611. Isaac Casabon, an early philologist and alchemist, uh, dated the Hermetic Corpus to about the second or third century AD or CE. And afterwards the magical and scientific community at the time just kind of dropped it uh, and threw the baby out with the bathwater. They just didn't want to have anything to do with it since it wasn't as old as they thought it was. Interesting. And uh, that kind of allowed science and, uh, or the sciences that we know today to kind of get a foothold instead of uh, astrology and astronomy and the things that were being practiced uh, more openly at the time. Okay. And we're talking essentially about the turn of the first millennium here that these, they began to, uh, distance themselves from hermeticism is that when, or is this a, l- a little bit later than that well the, you see hermeticism arise and then it, it almost immediately is snuffed out in western Europe uh, oh, wow. by the dark ages we just kind of they lose all of this uh, it is bur- some of it's burned by uh, enthusiastic Christians mm, uh, right. <laughs> like, Love you, zealous. like you do um <laughs> And some of it was just lost. Uh, we It survived in monasteries in Syria. So there were uh, Arabic and Isl- Islamic scholars that still had this material and were using it to great success. Wow. Uh, but that's, that's its own story. Um, what happened is about the 11th century, um, there was a, a collection effort to try and find some of these lost manuscripts that we knew about but didn't necessarily have. And... Um, I'll have to go into my notes. I don't remember who it was that picked it up. Um, but essentially it was, it, it started in Spain. Uh, the alchemists and her- hermeticists started translating and publishing all these uh, works that they would picked up from Syria. And then it started to bleed into Italy and France and Germany. And it, over the next two or 300 years from about the 11th century to the f- early 1500s, it, it slowly uh, snowballs into this actual legitimate precursor to science. Interesting. And that's when essentially we begin applying the label of alchemy and stuff to to these ideals of um, of chasing knowledge, right? Philology, um, trying to, uh, you know, in love of knowledge, in love of studying something. And that's where kind of alchemy is birthed out of. Mm-hmm. It's, it goes hand in hand with hermeticism. What you see is a clear distinction between what they call practical alchemy or, or physical alchemy and spiritual or philosophical alchemy. Ah, uh, yes. It, so it, it was the goal that the alchemist had that was important. Okay. Uh, and it, it pretty much goes into the... The practical alchemists were going for the philosopher's stone, the uh, prima materia. Right, transmutation, mm-hmm. lead into gold and whatnot. Just basically the, the mastery of power. They were looking to master these transformative uh, processes that normally take place in nature, but they were trying to uh, pr- do it in a laboratory and speed it up. <laughs> right. And as humans have always done. As been we have to. always done. Yeah. And the, the practical alchemist birthed medical science as we know it. We have a lot of famous uh, guys like Paracelsus, who was a practical alchemist, but his goals were philosophical. Um, He's even quoted as saying, give me just a sec. It's a, he was the inventor of pills as we know it. Okay. Um, He made a lot of groundbreaking, uh, Research. He did a lot of groundbreaking research in plant medicines. He was the first guy to really get the idea that medicinal plants had an essence that could be extracted, and he was uh, using alcohol. He was using or alcohol. Using something, yeah. Uh, his solvent. They're called uh, spagyrics, or uh, we call them tinctures today, okay. um, where you take a, a high proof alcohol and extract plant medicines into the alcohol, mm-hmm. and it, this preserves it and sometimes strengthens it. Mm-hmm. Um, or, um, or it, it is used to, uh, to like use up all of the chemicals in a plant or something, right? Mm-hmm. So like your, your body has, um, 
So I know like with uh, some of these entheogens, like your body has inhibitors, inhibiting chemicals already in your liver or your pancreas, and you eat them and and nothing happens. Mm -hmm. But if you distill them or if you, uh, you extract them using alcohol or some other kind of solvent in that respect, then it makes it so it's... uh, Basically, so your body can uh, it no longer inhibit it, and you can use it as the medicinal product, right? Uh, with with some, yes. Like with DMT, that's that's the case. Um, you can ingest amounts of DMT and not get high. Um, it's when you have an AM- MAOI present in your gut that uh, you your body can't break it down as fast, so you do get you do get stoned. Um, okay. That's. That's not necessarily true with all compounds, but an MAOI, like you mentioned, would work on a lot of different things. Okay. Uh, so like a mushroom experience would be exponentially more powerful if you also had MAOI in your, in your gut. Interesting. Um, okay. But you don't necessarily run around with like uh, endogenous psilocybin in your, in your body. Okay. Um, no, but, you but we DMT. do have, but we do have things like DMT and, uh, or well, there's evidence that we have endogenous DMT, uh, but you do have like an endocannabinoid system. You have, you have endogenous cannabinoids right. in your body. And that's why people sense. get like a runner's high. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Paracelsus. That's right. Um, yes, Paracelsus. He, he's quoted as saying, uh, poison is in everything and no thing is without poison. The dosage is either a poison or a remedy. Oh, so interesting. Well, I mean, water will kill you if you drink enough of it. Exactly. Yeah. And his that was his whole basis for uh, his pursuit of medical science was he was passionate about plant medicines. He he knew there was virtue in these in these medicines. And uh, it's his, a way to get to God. <laughs> well, his method to God was laudanum. Actually, he was quoted uh, as saying, yes. "I have made a great discovery. The center of my alchemical opus is the magic of laudanum." <laughs> um, and I know a lot of writers use laudanum. Oh and God! Yes. Fact, I mean, contemporaries of Joseph were using it as, mm-hmm. as uh, their uh, fuel for creativity. There's many a poet that has used uh, laudanum and. Uh, opium as their method. Yeah, I was going to say, I'm like, I'm fairly certain Poe was an opium addict, right? Mm-hmm. Well, and that's what laudanum is, is a is an opium tincture, essentially. Oh, okay. Uh, so you're taking bits of opium and extracting that out into an alcohol tincture. Interesting. Um, and then it was used at the time of, uh, like the, in the 19th century where Joseph would have been running around, it was most often used for... Uh, pain relief and you would just take like an eyedropper full and put it in a glass of water type thing uh yeah or to uh if you're going to get a leg operation to stop the pain or from, to, exactly. from surgery or something to that take effect. a big old swig yeah yeah anyway uh yeah so this uh paracelsus uh he's uh, so he was um late 15th cent or 1500s i believe um okay. and he, he was a well, I guess we'll talk about John D later, uh, but for the sake of um, entheogens and their evolution in alchemy and hermeticism, uh, Paracelsus, as far as I can tell, was where the movers and shakers really started to get it. Once Paracelsus uh, work, Paracelsus's work was available uh, to the average guy who was interested in this, you start to see a lot more adepts. Uh, an adept is a person uh, or an alchemist who had discovered the secrets of the philosopher's stone. They had discovered their method from gnosis, uh, and they were considered. Which was what? That's that is uh, bears some discussion. Some people, <laughs> okay, it depends on who you're asking. Um, some people, like like Young, thought that the philosophical uh, alchemists were using their descriptions of the philosopher's stone as a metaphor for their transformation as a human being. Uh, so that the, the transmutation of base metals into gold is analogous to the transmutation of a base human, uh, through the pursuit of knowledge and education, turning into a more noble person. An adept. Exactly. Okay. Um, and some people like myself would, would take that even one step further and say that, uh, the method for that transmutation was gnosis, that a a moment of direct 
uh, connection to God or uh, some sacred esoteric knowledge that you're, you're pursuing. And okay. people who could elicit this response on a regular basis were considered adepts. Um, and it's from what we can tell, Paracelsus was uh, clearly an adept. He, he has several Some formula. A stoner. <laughs> well, if you, if you say the center of your alchemical opus is the magic of laudanum, I'm right. sure it's, <laughs> it's not your first time using it. Um, we see, so from about early 1600s to the late 1700s, there is an explosion in the amount of uh, adepts uh, running around in, uh, in the field. Okay. Um, and a lot of the people that we would recognize, um, although Benjamin Franklin himself was not an alchemist as far as we can tell, he knew a lot of the big alchemists of the time, and we'll go into this more in the next podcast because it kind of touches on the Joseph Smith timeline. Okay. Um, but Benjamin Franklin, we know, sat in on several alchemical demonstrations. He knew a lot of the people who were claiming to be adepts. Um, and he even had uh, one of his friends in 1773, Samuel Danforth, uh, who served as a judge and chief justice of Massachusetts for over three decades wrote a letter to Benjamin Franklin offering to send him pieces of the legendary Philosopher's Stone. So... I've always uh, heard of the Philosopher's Stone as essentially just this amorphous idea more than it is an actual thing. It what is. did he have that he would have been sending to Benjamin Franklin? It is my belief that uh, during this time period, especially t- the beginning towards the end of the, s- the 1700s, Especially in England and France, uh, the Philosopher's Stone is pretty uh, reliably. Um, I'm I'm pr- I think it can be pretty reliably called a mushroom. Um, <laughs> I, I just don't know how to. It's, yeah, I mean that's pretty straightforward. But I I mean you have basis for this. Yeah, mycology wasn't really an understood uh, field at the time, and mushrooms weren't really understood taxonomically. Um, people had a hard time categorizing exactly what they were. And if you know anything or have like played with mushrooms, it is kind of hard to tell what they are. Yeah, they're kind they're, of a plant. They're spongy, but they don't yeah. have leaves and, and they, they don't necessarily have to grow in sunlight. And sometimes they grow on wood and sometimes under they're, cow dung and they're or, super fibrous. So they yeah. could be wood. It could be a stone. It could be a sponge. Yeah. It's not a vegetable because it doesn't have seeds. It's an immaculately conceived, uh, uh, seemingly immaculately conceived just springs up out of nowhere it's exactly not, it's not like you go plant mushrooms you, they just drop spores and mm-hmm. they, they spawn from more and more spores that are carried on the wind or whatever exactly and they didn't know that at the time um so yeah, i mean that's I guess, that's a 20th century understanding of mycology. exactly and this whole this whole period bears its own entire fucking podcast um so i'm that's a really good idea i'm having to (laughs) isn't it (laughs) i'm having to to, uh skip a lot of this so i'm i'm sure if anybody's like sitting in their car listening to this in an air clawing rage that they're um (laughs) it's i know how shocking it sounds you just need to sit and uh maybe look up some of the resources we'll have in the show notes because this isn't just I'm not just jumping to these conclusions. This is this is pretty well established theories. Um, right. Uh, this isn't just me. And when you consider things like this, um, this was a coin that was minted <laughs> by Benjamin Franklin. And this is yeah. there's other interpretations of this, but I see mycelium and a mushroom sprouting out of Lady Liberty's head. I mean, I see a bell. So, but bells look like mushroom caps. I mean, but there's no like a bell. I mean, okay. So I'm going to describe this. This is a, it's essentially a coin has Lady Liberty on it with flowing hair, like she's riding in a convertible, and spawning out of that flowing hair, it looks like a mushroom. Now, one might claim because there's that little ridge right there. Mm-hmm. One might claim that that looks like a bell. But there's no gonger on the bell. There's no, like, big center thing that hits the sides of the bell. It's just a stick coming out of her hair, and it looks like the stem of a mushroom. And the whole thing looks much like a mushroom. And it is dated July 1776. The five. the contention is that she is wearing a what's called a Phrygian cap. Phrygian cap. A Phrygian cap was worn... Uh, 
it's a long standing symbol of freedom and liberty. Okay. Um, it's, we could go into that on its own, but Phrygian caps do not look like this. And I can show you, <laughs> I can show you a picture of a Phrygian cap. It a looks nothing like this. And who the fuck wears their hat on their <laughs> neck like that? Yeah. Like coming out of their hair, out of the back of their neck. Um, and that doesn't make sense. And, Wow, if you can see, it Holy even has a veil, shit. and this is a perfect representation of what is called a liberty cap. This oh, is a psychedelic cap. mushroom okay. that grows all over England, Wales, France, Germany. Like, So the philosophers and alchemists and hermeticists at the time, it's not a great leap to speculate that they were at least familiar with something called a fucking liberty cap right. and then going and running around minting coins yeah. with Lady Liberty and a goddamn mushroom coming out of her neck. <laughs> and of course, there's a, there's going to be this picture, a link for this picture in the show notes. It's not just, I mean, this isn't something that got photoshopped onto. These are coins that exist. And, then, um, this, and you can look at it for yourself. We're not just coming, you know, we're not just pulling this out of our ass. We're, we're talking about, we're describing this picture that we have here of a real coin. And it's not just me picking a coin and, and saying that there's symbolism there. This was, uh, this was discussed between Benjamin Franklin and a friend of his. In 1783, Sir William Oriental Jones Jr., who is the basis for Indiana Jones. <laughs> All uh, right. The real life Indian. Received a letter from Benjamin Franklin telling him about the Libertas Americana uh, medal that he had just minted, the one we were talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, in the letter, Franklin implies that he and Jones likely discussed the proposed medal while in Paris. He writes, quote, The engraving of my medal, which you know was projected before the piece, is just but finished. You will see that I have profited by some of your ideas and adopted the mottos you were so kind to furnish. I, oh. I see that I'm as curious. What 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 are you, what are you talking about? Motto what? So um, let me read that again. Yeah. So this is in a letter between um, Oriental Jones Jr. and Benjamin Franklin. Benjamin Franklin had just been on a trip to Paris, and they were writing a letter back and forth about what they'd spoken about in Paris. Oh, okay, okay. And this is. He sent him a letter showing him the medal. So this is Benjamin Franklin. Quote, the engraving of my medal, which you know was projected before the piece, is but just finished. You will see that I have profited by some of your ideas and adopted the motives, the mottos you were so kind to furnish. What are these mottos that this is? Um, I, what is he referring to, I guess? That's what I'm curious about. Well, I, I think he's referring to a mushroom. Um, this isn't something that he would have been writing in a letter uh, out in the open like that. So by sending him a letter referring to this particular metal, which he would have had access to and could have looked at, mm -hmm. he was basically saying that, hey, I appreciate the good time you showed me and uh, introducing me to these materials. And, and here is a coin. as you can see, yeah. they've had a profound effect on me and what I consider liberty to be. Very uh, interesting. Um Again, th that's highly speculative, but it is yeah. interesting to know. And when you look again, just look at this. Just look at it. <laughs> <laughs> Listeners, just go to the show notes right now. Pause. We'll wait for you. We'll be here when you come back. Go to the show notes and click on this uh, Liberty. Uh, let's let's Liberty. Look, Liberty coin picture. Uh, Liberty cap coin picture. <laughs> look at it for yourself. What do you think? Okay. That's all. It's speculation, yes, but even go one step further and maybe Google Phrygian caps and just look at what a real Phrygian cap looks like and how you actually would wear one, or a Liberty cap for Lady Liberty, <laughs> or a Liberty cap the mushroom, yeah. and just compare all of those things and, <laughs> yeah. and come to your own conclusion. Okay, that's um, fair. So moving on. Um, Actually, I guess there is no moving on. We've kind of jumped back and forward in the timeline so much. Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> where, where, I guess where where would you like to see this go? Yeah. Um, so that is talking on Benjamin Franklin. That's I think getting uh, dangerously close to what we want to talk about in episode two. So let's take a step back and talk more about alchemy, um, leading up to its influence and. <laughs> its connections to the enlightenment and to, um, people chasing knowledge, you know, philologists and whatnot. Okay. Um, so 
if we go back uh, before, I guess we should go back before Paracelsus and mention John D very quickly. Or I guess we should go back even further than that. Kabbalah, uh, which had a great impact on Mormonism, especially in the later part of Joseph's career after 1841 when he became associated with Alexander Neighbor. Um, okay. That it had a great influence on the later part of Mormonism, but for the sake of our discussion today and the next podcast, it doesn't have a lot to do with the beginning timeline. So okay. we're going to kind of glaze over it. But for the sake of argument, Kabbalah begins to infuse itself into Hermetic thought about the 13th century Spain. Um, and what exactly is Kabbalah? Is it a, a certain philosophy or what is Kabbalah? It's a, it's a secret uh, school of... Um, in, in Hebrew, Kabbalah means tradition. So okay. it, it can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Um, it... Essentially, today, the way we look at it, it's, it's, a, it's an esoteric school of uh, Judaic thinking that spread throughout Western thinking at the same time Hermeticism and alchemy did. And it had a profound influence on its evolution. Hmm. Um, the, the reason I'm kind of glazing over it for our argument today is because there's not a lot of evidence that the Kabbalists were using entheogens. Okay. There is some. Uh, but again, for the sake of our argument and for, because it in, in inserts itself later in our timeline, we don't ne re necessarily need to talk about it today. Okay. Um, <laughs> all right. Because it, it's such a, it's its own thing. Uh, Lance Owens has a great article that'll be in the show notes. If you want to know more about Kabbalah and how it influenced uh, Mormonism and uh, alchemy and hermeticism in general, I highly recommend that article. Okay. Um, you happen to have the title of that off the top of your head? Uh, Just so the listeners know which note they're looking for in the, the show notes or which I line. Do. And just like all the listeners know, like Cody came here prepared. He has three books, uh, two books with him um, and a huge set, you know, maybe 50 pages of notes and his tablet. So, uh, we're working on a lot of material here. We're, we're sifting through a lot to try and find our sources. Um, this is the Joseph Smith and the Kabbalah, the Occult Connection by Lance Owens. Okay. Um, and that's published online. Uh, again, I'll give you the, the link for that so you can put it in the show notes. Perfect. Um, so, practical or philosophical alchemy, those who uh, mastered the stones we talked about were called adepts. Um, the, we talked about the evolution in the 16th and 18th centuries where we begin to see a lot more adepts and people util utilizing the secrets of the stone. Um, which you contend is Amanita, which I, well, it could be a number or of things. A, a I, mushroom or something. I guess I should clarify. I contend that the philosopher's stone was anything that could achieve gnosis for, so for Paracelsus, his his preferred method of gnosis was laudum. He loved using not laudum, and he talked about it openly. Um, and the reason he would have done so with laudum and not mushrooms is because of the... Um, there's a, a stark history of church and state authorities trying to suppress this, certain entheogens, especially the ergots and the uh, mushrooms, because much more so than any other ones, they elicit a, a radical uh, reevaluation of one's life. And they're innately um, counterproductive to a lot of the goals of the state and, and church authorities. Um, they are... Um, hold on. I, I mean, would you claim that there has been active suppression sim uh, just simply out of fear of people becoming smarter? I mean, would you go as far as saying such a thing? Or, I mean, that sounds far too conspiratorial for myself, but... Um, well, they... Hold on, I have... Uh, I'm sorry, I'm going all over the place. This is... No need to apologize. Um, it's a broad topic. There's so much to, to discuss here. So... Due to these substances' pre predisposition to induce free thought or provide a direct and accessible conduit to the divine, I think that's probably the most 
threatening aspect of these of these compounds to church and state authorities because <laughs> we have God, we have access to God, and, and we'll have, tell you what God says exactly. Right, right. But if you, and that's why the uh, the the Protestant movement was so groundbreaking was because it was the first time somebody stood up to the church and said, "Fuck you, right. we believe in personal revelation, and we get to talk to God too." And as did Joseph and exactly in personal revelation, even when it was to the detriment of his own authority claims. This kind of, so this is a quote from the Hermeticum. And if it get, I think it beautifully illustrates that idea, this, this idea that you have this ability in you and everyone can use it. Okay. Um, this is from the Hermetic Corpus. Quote, if then you do not make yourself equal to God, you cannot apprehend God, for like is known by like. Leap clear of all that is corporeal and make yourself grown to a like expanse with that greatness which is beyond all measure. Rise above all time and become eternal, then you will apprehend God. Think for you too that nothing is impossible. Deem that you too are immortal, and that you are able to grasp all things in your thought, to know every craft and science, find your home in the haunts of every living creature, make yourself higher than all heights and lower than all depths, <laughs> bring to, together in yourself all opposites of quality, heat and cold, dryness and fluidity, think that you are everywhere at once, on land, at sea, in heaven, think that you are not yet begotten, that you are in the womb, that you are young, that you are old, that you have died, that you are in the world beyond the grave. This is all very psychedelic. Right, well, and it's yeah, it's just if, it's it a, sounds like a tripping philosopher. And if you look at the early church and the early Christians, this is the minds that they had. It's funny that in the next paragraph, this is the kind of mindset that we've taken today. <laughs> but uh, Maybe Saul of Tarsus is responsible for, you know, kind of... <laughs> uh, it, so this is how it finishes. But if you shut up your soul and your body in your body and abase yourself and say, I know nothing. I can do nothing. I'm afraid of earth and sea. I cannot <laughs> mount to heaven. Uh, that I, internet will get you. Oh my God. <laughs> then, uh, nor, nor do I know what I was, nor what I shall be. Then what do you have to do with God? So this is the hermetic, uh, I, philosophy. This is, uh, human beings are the brother of God. We are, we are uh, partners in this process of, of reality. And we are not this weak, maggoty worm that is, you know, uh, only survives at the grace of some um, masochistic god that sits on a throne in the clouds. Well, I mean, even the very foundation of the Hebrew religion is... Eve partook of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And then when God came back after Adam and Eve had both eaten, he said, where are they? Why are you hiding yourselves from me? Why are you hiding your nakedness? And if I'm not mistaken, he says they are equal to us. Mm -hmm. And that's when they're kicked out of the... the out of, the, in, out of independence mm -hmm. and sent to Diamon. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. But yeah, I mean that's that's the very foundation of of Christianity and of the the Hebrew Abrahamic religions is the people that the first human beings came into conflict with God's will because they wanted to know the difference between good and evil, or they were tempted there by a serpent, or whatever the case may be. But because they came to a knowledge that God could no longer control that and they have their own free will that is a threat essentially to the plan right mm -hmm. and if you look at some of the early church art that you had mentioned that we were i guess that was where we started um <laughs> that a lot of it has to do with adam and eve i think because anyone who's taken these substances or had one of these experiences can easily tell you that this is probably one of the most profound and life-changing experiences you can go through. And yeah, I've, I've heard, uh, personally, I've heard people that have said, um, after they went on their first mushroom trip, essentially they were just completely changed for like months after that, or their entire perspective of something shifted completely. Like they were just a completely different person. Like it's, it's this very profound effect. I, I 
I remember the, uh, the first time I did LSD, uh, my friend, I was starting to come out of it and my friend took me to a restaurant to go eat. And, um, I thought I was, I was back in, uh, soberness, but the time came to pay the bill and it came to me in one giant flash. I'm sure to anyone watching, it looked like I was on drugs and didn't know what money was. <laughs> But in that moment, I understood money so perfectly and in a way I'd never thought about before that it stopped me and I couldn't progress with the interaction of like paying for my food because I saw paper all of a sudden and realized that everything that we exchange these pieces of paper for are simply representations of time and energy. Yeah, true. And you just made me a meal that I enjoyed Profoundly. And so now I give you how paper. can I how can I give you little pieces of paper because I didn't earn these. I, this doesn't represent my time and energy. So, but in a way it does. Right? But it, so just the profound confusion that uh, birthed out of this simple interaction uh, was just because I I suddenly in one flash understood something that I've been using my entire life, right. but understood it in such a drastically and groundbreaking way that it um, completely forever changed my interaction with money. And <laughs> well, and I also must say that it doesn't require drugs to get uh, or, you know, any chemical in Induction in order to get that people have quote unquote shower thoughts all the time. Oh, yeah. You know, when you're laying in bed and your mind is just racing on that problem you've been working on at work and you just can't figure it out. And suddenly, you know, the light bulb goes off. You know, that's a very, you know, it's a profound paradigmatic shift of your understanding of something. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's essentially what you had. Mm -hmm. And it, it, that's all this is. It's just a, a compound that elicits that response. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the first experiments they conducted when they started doing trials with LSD was getting a group of mathematicians and engineers into a room and dosing all of them and just saying <laughs> they, they had them come in with uh, a problem they'd been working on for several months and just couldn't wrap their head around mm -hmm. uh, because they recognized that these compounds do this. And so they had all these professionals come in with problems they were working on, dosed them, and then just played jazz and let them kind of like loiter around and talk with each other. And by the end of the night, not only had the men like solved all the problems that they were working on, they had solved other problems that had been bothering them. And some of the people d observing this were talking about uh, how it didn't just look like they were solving problems. It looked like they were showing off. Like it looked like they were suddenly <laughs> doing art. Like there was an architect who was trying to work on a bridge that was troubling him. And instead of just finishing the bridge he had designed, he designed a completely new bridge that was, <laughs> that was an expression of himself. It was still structurally sound, but it was a beautiful bridge. Now it wasn't just, so uh, yeah, I gotta, I gotta see that. I have to, I have to see the study. I have to see it myself, and um, hopefully you'll you'll be able to pull that up, and we'll we'll put that in the show notes mm -hmm. as well. Because I mean, even that, I, I'm <laughs> skeptical of a claim that you know all of these people suddenly miraculously had a whole new profound understanding. But it's like you know, personally not having interaction with any of these chemicals myself. I haven't, I, I don't have the level of empathy for what, you know, one of these reactions was mm -hmm. like, or, you know, what these people were experiencing. And I'd love to, to read the study or read, um, at least some of the, uh, some accounts from people that were involved there. A better documents, a better documented study that might be of help, uh, is the pink good Friday experiment or the, the white chapel experiment, I believe. Okay, White um, Chapel experiment. Let me look this up. Yes. Yeah, uh, definitely. In, so this was a experiment by Walter Pank in the 1960s uh, where he took uh, a group of theologians uh, from the Harvard uh, Theological School, I believe, mm -hmm. and they went to White Chapel and he basically dosed all of them with psilocybin and wanted to see how regularly you could elicit a um, divine experience or to elicit gnosis. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I feel like I'm connected to God, mm -hmm. right? And consistently, I, I don't have this study up in front of me, but 
statistically it was something like nine out of 10 of the guys that went and participated had a full blown one to 10, 10 being talk to God experience. All of them had nines or tens. And the one guy who didn't still did, but he claimed he could achieve that through meditation. Interesting. So, so it's a White Chapel experiment. Yes, the White Chapel, also known as the Good Friday experiment. Uh, Rick Doblin from Maps wrote a follow-up uh, analysis of that uh, experiment, which is also really good to read because it's like 25, 30 years after the fact. And oh, wow. He goes back and tracks down some of these guys and sees just what that experiment meant to you. And a lot of them 30 years later still said that's one of the most profound experiences I've ever had in my life. Wow. No so, kidding. Okay. These aren't, it's not just shower thoughts or like, right. or just right. profound moments. These are, you can regularly elicit uh, experiences where you are connecting with what you experience as the divine. I think regularly and reproducibly. I think that's, those are probably the two most important pieces to the puzzle is what we're talking about here is, um, reproducible in a lab experiment. Um, it works, of course, people with different biologies have different reactions to different chemicals, of course, but by and large, the vast majority of people are going to react similarly to, um, to getting over the threshold dosages of psilocybin or whatever. Mm -hmm. They're going to have similar feelings, similar actions. You know, these people feeling like they achieved gnosis or talk to God, right? Um, They all, all of the people involved in the study essentially had that connection because they were all given a chemical to induce it. Yes. It's really, really simple. Our brains run off of chemicals. Our bodies are chemicals. We are all just chemicals. And when you introduce a chemical into your body that is not normally inherently there, it's going to do something, whether that happens to be an antidepressant, an opium, um, alcohol, or a hallucinogen. All of those chemicals have effects on us. And wonderfully, because it's all chemistry, it's all reproducible. Exactly. We can do it. You know, we can reproduce this study no matter where we go to, no matter who the, the group subject or, you know, the subject uh, population is well. We should reproduce it. we should talk about that a little bit because it okay. do, it does matter who is doing it and where and when because set and setting is of paramount importance. Yeah, and this experiment, especially the Good Friday experiment, would not have been as successful if it had not taken place in a church. If they had done it at a Walmart, it would have been totally <laughs> different. Um, oh my god! One of the funniest videos I think I've ever seen. And I saw this probably six years ago or something on the internet. It's a guy who went to a dog show for his first trip. He oh, just ate a bunch, of, a bunch of shrooms and went to a dog show that and went on the awful. floor and went interviewing people. And yeah, some of the descriptions <laughs> and like he was any time that he would get near a dog, he was just like petting it so much and just like staring at the dog mm-hmm. and, and you know playing with its fur and stuff. It's, it just seems so hilarious to me, but it's like. I can't imagine a worse place to be tripping, right? <laughs> and don't get me horrible. Don't get me wrong. You like these; these can be used recreationally too. All right. Um, it's it's a conjunction of dosage, uh, timing, set, and setting, and a number of things that all working together elicit this very repeatable uh, uh, response. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's not. I don't want to give anybody the false impression that they can just take something and go off and they're going to talk to God because that's very much not the case. Well, but there is a science to this and there is a, a, a repeatable science. And that probably plays a lot into the ritualism of it. Um, I just recently watched a documentary called The Last of the Medicine Men and it talks about the, the shamanic uh, pilgrimage that happens in um, the... I cannot remember. that they start the, the name of the tribe starts with a W or it's a... <laughs> um, Wakar, no, not Wakari. Um, it's it's essentially the Native American Church, um, the, the group that lobbied for the Native American Church, the incorporation of it, and the legalization of peyote for their religious practices. Mm-hmm. Uh, they have this pilgrimage every February where they go uh, in search of peyote. Now, in ancient times, it took three months to do this pilgrimage, and you spent the three months, you know, wandering through the desert, starved thirsting you're you're uh, you're essentially pushing your body to the at most upper limits that your your human body can handle and then you go 
to this little area in the desert that it just has peyote everywhere and you eat the peyote and you have incredible reaction. I mean, incredible visions. And the person that was doing the documentary, he was a, um, I think he was a reporter with the BBC or uh, somebody, uh, whoever funded essentially the journalism. He, he had never imbibed in any of these before. And when he took his threshold dosage, uh, he just walks around the the desert with a camera pointed at him and he's trying to describe things that are happening to him but it's just so profound that he can't he can't describe it well it's beyond words it it is it's totally unenglishable it's it's very hard to articulate the things that you see and experience in these states and give it any justice. Um, and, and we're, we're living in the 21st century. We have, you know, an amazing vocabulary. We have an amazing understanding of chemistry. Nowadays, you go back a hundred years, how much, how much more inept were they at trying to describe this? I, I don't know if inept is the right word. They just, just use different vocabulary, the vocabularies, the idea that, uh, spirits or uh, alcohol has a spirit in it com- is just their way of describing what they saw so you see we some- call it a social lubricant yeah and you they would see somebody imbibe this this alcohol and almost become possessed and it was a repeatable experience so it i think there a lot of it is just uh, you have to kind of put yourself in their mindset and and look at the situation and you in doing so, you realize it, it's not always out of ignorance or lack of vocabulary. It's just these experiences cannot be articulated, and you can only describe it so well. Mm-hmm. Um, even today, there's entire books of trip reports that are just woefully uh, inac- I- I- unable to really uh, give anybody who hasn't had these experiences an idea of what to expect. Hmm. Interesting. But, um. So maybe we, maybe we should call that um, essentially our first episode here because there's a lot of information there to chew on, and we've kind of covered essentially a, a little bit of the history, jumping all over the place. A very, very little. Very, little bit of very, history. very small amount. And like you said, I mean, this deserves a podcast in and of itself, a whole separate podcast to talk about. Um, but where it comes into more... I guess, relevance in this show is because I um, personally think that this is a theory uh, that Joseph may have been using hallucinogens or may have been using some of these these ethnogens. Uh, I think this theory needs to be discussed. Whether it's right or wrong, it needs to be discussed. It needs to be um, out in the public square. And um, if it offers explanatory power, then it is worth discussing. And in and of itself, I feel like it does, and it, that, that we need to do that. So why don't we go ahead and stop this episode there? Okay. Um, do you want to add anything more to, to this portion of our discussion before we move on to talking about Joe? Um, maybe we could just give some brief references. So, or yeah, just yeah, so. Yeah. People get a better idea that uh, this is a well-established theory by very re- well-respected uh, scholars and doctors, and <laughs> this isn't just... I, it's not just you and me bullshitting right <laughs> now, right? I know how I sound. I'm not the most articulate guy, and uh, <laughs> I am definitely not a tenured professor of any kind, so... Well, like I said, this is our third conversation. You've blown my mind out in all three of our conversations, so... Um, I think you're doing quite well as far as articulation goes, but your research in and of itself, I think, speaks much more standalone on its own merits, dis- er, in spite of who is delivering it. Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so j- here's some books for your audience to just kind of look up on their own, and I'm sure they'll be in the show notes. Um, uh, uh, Clark Heinrich wrote a book, Magic Mushrooms in Religion and Alchemy. Uh, that's a very... Um, helpful book, especially when you're going over this uh, in a sequential timeline. He really breaks down uh, the history of this uh, entheogen use, especially with mushrooms, um, and how they played a part in the uh, birth of Hermeticism and alchemy. Okay. Um, 
well, Western alchemy, because Chinese and uh, Islamic alchemy, like we said, is a whole different <laughs> history. Um, there's Jonathan Ott uh, wrote a book called The Pharmacothean, uh, Entheogen- Entheogenic Drugs, Their Plant Sources and History. Uh, that's another great book that that probably covers this more in depth from a uh, a chemical uh, ethnobotany perspective, like ha- really how these chemicals work, what they do to you physiologically and neurologically. I'd be really interested in that because I want to understand essentially the chemicals uh, that I mean, why such alkaloids and uh, chemicals do what they do to us and why it's so repeatable. That one would interest me. It uh, is a very good one. Another one on the same uh, in the same vein is uh, by Richard Elvin Schultz. Uh, I talked about him a little bit. He's the uh, professor that kind of uh, established his career on being a neutral uh, uh, voice for all of this. Mm-hmm. Um, he has several books out. Just just look up him, and basically any book he's ever written is going to be helpful in the subject. That's, uh, you said Richard M. Schultz. Yes. Okay. Uh, um, and then Clark Heinrich, again, he wrote another book called Strange Fruit, Alchemy, Religion, and Magical Foods. It's another great one. Uh, Dan Merker has wrote, written a few books about the history of psychedelic sacraments. Um Mm-hmm. He wrote, That'd be interesting. That's a very good one. Uh, he wrote two books on that subject, uh, specifically talking about manna and how manna was very likely a, a psilocybin mushroom. Oh, fuck. I didn't even think about that. Oh, oh God. We didn't go into that? I, no, oh. I, didn't, I didn't even think about manna as it being... Oh, okay, just, that makes so much sense. I, mean, I know we mentioned it in our other conversation about just yeah, being glazed not, not over today, Moses, yeah. but Moses bears a lot of attention. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of attention. Oh, now now I feel like I want to reopen this discussion up. Uh, because, well, and we didn't even talk about like the other pictures you sent over that are... Uh, Adam and Eve with like mushrooms in the middle and like a snake curling I know up. We, but like, there's we, so much we didn't even touch on. Well, and there's stuff I glazed over too, like the Eleusis. I there's a whole the whole scene where they're breaking off penises is is hilarious. But uh, did I not tell you? That, that doesn't uh, sound familiar. Oh my god! No, maybe that. Okay, oh, here, I can't, dude. We have collectively we have talked like six hours by this point. <laughs> I can't remember all of it. Okay, well, very quickly, I'll tell this story and then we'll 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 be done. <laughs> um, <laughs> this is has to do with the uh, Eleusinian mysteries. So, like I said, for two thousand years, this was an almost uninterrupted uh, yearly event, mm-hmm. and. Um, participants were sworn to secrecy. You you could experience this once in your lifetime and you could never speak of it again, even with people who participated. So as far as we can tell, the secret was kept except for one incident or incident in Athens, 414 BC, Alcibiades, the famous apprentice and lover of Socrates was arrested and heavily fined for allegedly inciting a group to break off the phalluses of the statuary depicting Hermes throughout the city. (laughs) He was also charged with administering the Eleusinian mysteries to his dinner guests. Oh, it sounds shit. like he threw fucking awesome parties, right? And he, they were running around town breaking off statue dicks. Now, <laughs> now tell me if somebody's drinking the Eleusinian mysteries and then they're all getting together and <laughs> let's let's go break let's go break off Hermes' dick. <laughs> You guys go that way, I'm going to go this way. We'll meet back here with the dicks. Yeah, that just sounds like a guy's having fun with hallucinogens to me. That doesn't sound like that, alcohol. Okay, stuff. but there are plenty of frat who do that all the time. <laughs> true, without true. Anti- anti- but they're not, but they're not charged, by, charged with uh, administering a very secret cult uh, <laughs> right to their dinner guests. Right, know? yeah, that's, that's probably the piece of the puzzle that really adds a bit more to this. Um, but of course course like this all of this information is fucking dense like this is this is really really heavy information and i've only really been exposed to this since uh, i did the episode on the kirtland uh temple dedication ceremony Mm -hmm. and that i i really hadn't happened upon the theory until i put that episode out and then you know and i did the research for the episode and put it out there and then I was flooded with articles from people that are like, yeah, this is, there's people have been talking about this for a long, long time. Mm-hmm. It's like, that makes sense. That, and, 
Given the scenarios and the situations, it makes sense. But that being said, I'm only really recently being introduced to all of this information. It's brand new for me. Um, obviously, you've been studying it for you know half a decade. You've been doing a lot, reading a lot more of these books. I've been studying Mormon history for the last half a decade. So, and you I mean, know better than anyone when you study something like that. The talking Mormonese to somebody who doesn't know Mormonese, they're like, <laughs> yeah, right? Exactly. <laughs> so, yeah, and you're you're speaking Trippanese, and you know, <laughs> a people that don't understand Trippanese and have never you know read any of these books or heard of Richard M. Schultz. It's like, this is all a whole world that we're just peering into. Mm -hmm. We're only getting a very cursory understanding, just enough to get us into episode two, which is where we will go now! All right, and that was part one of my interview with Cody. Now, while it seems like we were jumping around like crazy, there's an insane amount of history that we had to try and cover in an hour and a half time. It just, there's simply too much. So, of course, episode two is going to talk about how this possibly impacted Joseph Smith and the uh, the restoration of the church, essentially. And this is a topic that I've learned to come at a very open mind with because it it seems um, very reasonable in my mind. And I'm looking forward to any possible feedback that people want to share in regards to this this theory, to Joseph Tripping theory, essentially, what I like to call it. So, um, you know... I'd love to get in touch with some of you and get your thoughts on this. Maybe there's some further research out there that um, wildly disproves this theory. But, of course, once we get into the second part of the discussion, I don't know. (laughs) It's very interesting. So be looking out for that next week. That will be coming out on December 29th. And, uh, yeah, we'll just, we'll go from there. Uh, but we got to close this episode down, of course, uh, with Christmas and all of the chaos going on here. It's, um, we'll, we'll do Patreon appreciation and listener mail segment come the new year. One more thing I needed to add really quickly. I was on the most recent episode of Scathing Atheist, where we discuss, um, this time in Mormon history. Now, this is the third installment of Mormon history on Scathing Atheist. The first installment was Carthage Jail Shootout. The second was Mountain Meadows Massacre. And now the third is talking about the Mormon-Missouri War. So if you want a little bit of a glimpse into what the future of uh, our our historical timeline holds, please check out uh, this episode of Scathing Atheist. It is a two-parter, so you get uh, one part of uh, the you know the second half of this week's episode of Scathing Atheist, of course, is going to be part one of it, and the episode that comes out on the 29th, that will be part two. Of course, there will be links for that in the show notes. Uh, but for now, I would need to thank a few people before calling it a night. First, I need to thank Demonista for posting up on the Facebook page. Recently, she posted about the uh, Mormon leaks, uh, which is essentially the WikiLeaks for Mormon documents. I can't wait to use some of their services in the future. Uh, next, I want to thank Jason Camo for providing the music that's used in the show with his permission. Check out his music at alloststateofmind.com. Also need to thank Craig Keeling for providing the artwork that's used in the show. Check out his blog at weirdmormonshit.com. Need to thank all of the patrons who support the show at patreon.com slash nakedmormonism that allow the research to continue. Of course, I would be remiss if I didn't mention how much I appreciate all of you listeners for tuning in. And I hope to talk to you next time here on the Naked Mormonism Podcast.